on this computer. Well, good morning, welcome, and happy new year. You don't have to think about the election right now because yeah. we have things that are much more interesting um, to uh, pursue this morning. We have, let's see, 167 participants at this point, and they are from all over the place. Shout out to our Wellfleet Garden Club um, members who are joining us once again. Uh, and people from uh, all walks, including the Garden Club and uh, the gardeners in New Canaan. Also welcome to our very newest member, Christina Fagerstahl. Uh, and I just got uh, information that you had joined us last night. So I hope that you are on this webinar so that you can enjoy this program as well. Um, Chanticleer is an amazing garden and I've had the pleasure to visit it. And um, I know that you will be enthralled with today's program. Uh, just one um, thing before we get going, I wanna thank everybody that participated in the Greens Workshop, making gnomes, uh, putting bows on wreaths, creating the giant wreaths, everything still looks wonderful. And um, that was a terrific effort that we were able to accomplish with the help of Garden Club and um, with our masks and social distancing. So gardening can go on uh, despite the limitations that we have. And we should be very proud that we are able to do those things. So I guess now I'll turn the meeting over to Nancy, but I just wanna say one thing. I had an article back here from the Financial Times, which is was in 2002, and this was, was when I, uh, 2000, yes, 2002, and this was when I first became aware of um, uh, Chanticleer Garden. And the headline for it uh, was "Planted to Perfection" by the very famous um, British garden uh, writer Robin uh, Lane Fox. And you know what? Chanticleer's gotten even better since that time. So uh, Nancy, who's a long-standing member of our program committee, um, take it away. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, members and friends of the New Canaan Beautification League. It is my privilege to welcome our first speaker of the year, Bill Thomas. He is the executive director of Chanticleer, a 48-acre public garden in Wayne, Pennsylvania on Philadelphia's main line. Bill had worked at the famed nearby Longwood Gardens for 26 years before he took his current position at Chanticleer in 2003. His vision for Chanticleer emphasized horticultural education, making it a true teaching garden that is not only artistically creative, but also environmentally sensitive, a very important mission for our times. As the executive director and head gardener of Chanticleer, Bill and his staff have created an ever-evolving pleasure garden with 15 distinct areas. Each area is designed and managed by an individual staff gardener with the focus on creating an artistic garden experience to delight all the senses. Bill encourages every member of his staff to create their own vision and provide inspiration for visitors to try in their own gardens. But before Bill begins, he would like to know, have you visited Chanticleer? And if you would please click the, the, the uh, answer on the screen, our poll, and we'll post those results very soon. But for those of you who have not visited Chanticleer, a treat awaits. It is a garden where you're encouraged to stray from the garden paths, walk on the grass, and fully explore the many delights and creative artistry that abounds. It is my pleasure to welcome Bill Thomas as he illustrates the art of gardening on an inspiring virtual trip to Chanticleer. Good morning. And uh, Patricia, I, uh, I'm having trouble sharing my screen. It says it's disabled, so we'll keep trying on that. But uh, Nancy, that's very nice. And I wish I were um, in New Canaan or in Wellfleet. Um, with all of you um, and seeing you in person. Um, and 
Tricia, it's still telling me it's just sharing. It's yeah, give me a second and I'll set that up for you. Very good. Um, so the um, I was in New Canaan uh, with this group uh, maybe 10 years ago and um, had visited on a very nice winter day. And uh, it's a sunny day here in uh, Wayne, Pennsylvania. Chanticleer is located just west of Philadelphia uh, in the area that's called uh, the Main Line. <clears throat> uh, it takes us about 20 minutes to get into Philadelphia if there's no traffic. Um, and, uh, and we're very, uh, we're not too far from the, the train station in Philadelphia and there's also uh, commuter lines out from that. And yeah, you should be all set. Great. All right. And so we call ourselves a pleasure garden. And what that means is that we hope that everyone who comes leaves in a better mood uh, than when they arrived. Uh, during this last year, which has been a tough year for all of us, uh, it was also very much a garden of solace, uh, a place that people could come, uh, relax, and to forget for a few moments the worries of the world. Um, most of the photographs of people that I'm showing are from uh, years before 2020, and what I'm hoping they'll symbolize uh, years going forth forward. Um, I'm sure you're all wondering if we, uh, we do plan to be opening. Uh, we'll be opening uh, March 31 uh, for the 2021 season and we are given good indications from the state government that we will be allowed to do so. We were in 2020 we opened in mid-June. Um, we do have parking reservations now which is a way of controlling the number of people in the garden at one, any one time. Uh, and we do ask people to wear masks if they are inside a building or near anyone else. In addition to being a pleasure garden, we're also a teaching or a learning garden. Um, we we hold, hold classes and workshops, um, some of which are done via Zoom. Um, but the garden itself is also a, a great place to learn, to see plants, uh, look at combinations and design. Um, we work with a number of professionals as well as amateurs uh, with courses, but we also encourage anyone who visits the garden uh, to talk with our staff, to ask questions, um, and really speak gardener to gardener. We're very interested in training the uh, next generation of horticulturists as well as helping train current horticulturists. Uh, so when we have uh, interns or or guest gardeners or and guest gardeners in the garden um, and guest gardeners come from other gardens uh, from around the world and work with our staff. These individuals are working with our, our staff members, our horticulturists, each of whom is in charge of an area. And so that horticulturist uh, designs the area as well as plants and maintains it. So uh, any intern working alongside the horticulturist is working with the person who's designed that area, planted it, and is now maintaining it. <clears throat> we also have some international programs, um, primarily uh, one with Great Dixter in England, uh, where we send an American student there for a year, um, each year starting at the end of the summer. Uh, and then we welcome guest gardeners, both internationally and nationally, to come and work with our staff, work in the garden. Chanticleer was the home of the Rosengarten family. Uh, they lived in Philadelphia, and in 1912, they bought uh, the Chanticleer property to build their summer home. Uh, and this gives, this is a shot from probably the, around 1919 uh, of the garden. The house was added on to in the 1920s and became their year-round residence. Um, this is Adolf and Christine Rosengarten Sr. Uh, he was head of uh, the Rosengarten pharmaceutical firm 
uh, and helped oversee its merger with Merck in the 1920s. Um, they had two children, and I'll mention those uh, shortly, uh, and then three grandchildren. And here, Mrs. Rosengarten is dancing with her elder grandson, who later became chairman of our board. Uh, sitting on the, her grandfather's lap is another board member. And then their younger brother uh, is here shown walking with his grandmother. And if you notice, uh, his grandmother, uh, Christine Rosengarten, uh, is carrying a bundle of twigs. Uh, whenever the story I've heard is that whenever she walked the garden, she picked up any uh, loose twig that she found. Uh, and I can attest, I can uh, certify that all of her grandchildren uh, do the exact same thing. And so, as you can imagine, I too now uh, pick up twigs whenever I walk around the garden. The name Chanticleer came from the Elder Rosengartens. Uh, they both enjoyed Thackeray, and uh, in one of the Thackeray novels from the mid 1800s, they mentioned uh, it mentioned a Chan a Chanticleer estate in England, which was uh, a fictional estate, but the most beautiful in the county, uh, but uh, mortgaged to the very castle windows. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that Ro uh, the Rosengartens had a big uh, uh, mortgage on the Chanticleer property, but I'm, I'm sure he spent more money than he planned to. Uh, and uh, so they, uh, took great fun in that naming it Chanticleer. And then Chanticleer is also the name of a French rooster. Uh, and so you'll see sculptures of roosters throughout the property. Um, the Rosengartens had two, two children. Um, each was given a house on the property. This is the house that was given to their son, Adolf Rosengarten Jr. Uh, the house uh, is pretty much in the center of the property uh, and is now the site of the ruin garden. Uh, Adolf and his wife, Janet, uh, were the, the visionaries of Chanticleer, the public garden. Uh, and they, in the 1970s, set up the Chanticleer Foundation to take over the property after their deaths. Um, Janet passed away in the 1980s. And when Adolf Jr. passed away in 1990, the property then was turned over to the Chanticleer Foundation to open a public garden. And we opened in 1993. In 1993, the property was mainly lawns uh, and trees. Uh, I think of it as like a, an English landscape park. Um, but Mr. Rosengarten did not restrict how we would develop the garden. Um, and the first director, Christopher Woods, uh, assembled a team of uh, very strong uh, and talented horticulturists. Uh, and they started developing the garden further. Uh, and then we have continued to do so. I'm the second director and I started in 2003. Adolf's sister, Emily, was given a house that was built for her uh, that is now uh, at the entrance to the garden. <clears throat> this is, the house was built in 1935 and this picture is from probably about 1937. And notice the tree um, right by the awning at the, uh, which is the west end of the house. Um, that's a, a hybrid oak tree, and this is what it looks like today. Uh, and it's a good reminder that we should all be planting small trees um, because the, the trees uh, under which uh, we enjoy the shade uh, and the beautiful sculptural forms of the trees, uh, all those big trees uh, that uh, make up our landscapes were once small. And so uh, we continue to plant small trees uh, as well as take great care of, of our trees. And now what I'm gonna do is do a virtual tour of the garden. And while we're going through it, I'll talk about how we do various things with the garden. But as I mentioned, the, the way we're set up is each area has a horticulturist who is in charge of it. And he or she uh, does the design of the area, the planting and the maintenance. Um, you might wonder then, what do I do? Uh, and one of the things is I, I'm in charge of helping make sure all these designs fit together. Uh, and of course, I do have a, 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 some say in the design, but the, the horticulturists are all very uh, skilled in what they do. Uh, and so usually it's just a discussion with very few changes from what they propose. 
Uh, at the entrance is the teacup garden named after this fountain uh, that's in the middle of it. Uh, we believe the fountain was purchased for, in Florence, Italy by the Rosen Gardens in the 1920s. Uh, the teacup garden is an area that gets designed twice uh, each year and is a brand new design each year. And so these three shots show you um, spring in uh, three different years. Um, and then we also do a different summer planting each year. Um, and as you look at the photos of Chanticleer, you'll notice that very often we highlight the foliage. And you're all gardeners, you, are, you know very much that uh, leaves, uh, the foliage color and textures give you much more bang for your buck. You don't have to deadhead, uh, foliage takes less time to groom uh, and it gives you uh, impact throughout the whole season. So in, in these three photos, um, it's really hard to even find a flower, yet I feel that the, these designs were really quite successful. Um, the, the teacup courtyard is uh, a south facing courtyard. Uh, that means it's really warm during the summer. We have a hot tropical summer uh, and we found that uh, tropical and semi-tropical plants are perfect for this area in that they, they really take the heat and the humidity, they, they thrive in it rather than suffering in it. Um, uh, and we're open until the end of October or the beginning of November each year. Uh, and usually we can get by without frost during that time. Um, and here, uh, here's another, uh, another year at the teacup garden in the upper photo. Um, it shows the spring display uh, with uh, muscari and, and tulips, uh, as well as agaves. And agaves, as long as they're hardened off when they're taken out of the greenhouse, uh, can take uh, a fair amount of cold in the spring. Uh, and then the summer planting shows that we didn't take out the agaves, we instead just evolved that landscape. And we added, as the bulbs finished up, we took them out and then planted other um, other items for the summer months. As you go further into the garden, you come to an area that was once the tennis court. And so we very unimaginatively call it the tennis court garden. Uh, you come down steps and this area was, if, if you haven't been to Chanticleer in the last couple of years, uh, this looks very different than it had looked for about 25 years. Uh, but we, we did this with curving uh, pathways and hedges um, and this area, instead of featuring non-hardy plants as teacup garden does, features uh, hardy plants, primarily perennials. And here's a view from above uh, showing the pathways and the, the hedges. Going a little further west into the garden, uh, you come to the orchard, uh, which was once a working orchard with uh, apples and cherry trees, and now is planted with flowering crab apples, uh, flowering cherries and then other ornamental plants such as the paper bark maple in the lower right. Um, in, the, in the spring, we have about a, a quarter of a million daffodils in the lawns, um, complemented with other bulbs such as conidoxa in the lower left. As you know, when you have a perennial planting of bulbs, you have to let the foliage fully ripen, um, wait until uh, it starts turning yellow before you can cut the leaves. And so if you're planting bulbs in a lawn, uh, you have to let the grass get long. Uh, we cut pathways uh, through the orchard. Uh, and I think actually the long grass as we're waiting for the foliage to ripen uh, looks almost like it's a part of um, that we planned it as I guess we did um, to be part of the display. And so uh, these are essentially rivers of bulbs that then become rivers of long grass in the spring. And then we, we cut the grass uh, usually the end of June. Some years we let it grow long again, uh, other years we keep it mowed uh, the whole time. Above the orchard at the top of the hill is the Chanticleer house. And this was the original house on the property built in 1912, 1913 by the elder Rosengartens. Uh, it's open for tours. Um, 
by prearrangement for groups. And then every Friday and Saturday, we have tours that the general public can sign up for. I give you that information. Um, right now, we're not planning to have the house open in April, uh, and we're just going to have to see how things go in 2021 with, with COVID crisis, uh, but we do plan to open it um, as soon as we can. There is a virtual tour on our website also uh, at chanticleergarden.org uh, that uh, gives you a view of the first floor of the house, which is what is open on the tour. And I'll mention the website name again, uh, address again. Um, originally, this is how you would have driven in to visit the Rosen Gardens. It was a, a paved parking area, um, not unattractive, but it was just fully paved. Uh, when we were going to become a public garden, it was redesigned uh, with a circle of gravel uh, in the middle uh, and then accolade flowering cherries around the side, underplanted with hellebores and hydrangeas. Uh, the idea was to make it much more garden-esque, but still give you the feeling that you could drive in on uh, to visit the Rosen Gardens. Um, our staff, the original design did not call for the gravel to be raked, but our staff really couldn't stand the idea of just messy gravel. Uh, and so this gets raked every day. Uh, and probably the prettiest time is about mid-April when the cherries are dropping their blossoms and fill the grooves of the raked gravel. Um, this gives you a view a little later in the summer uh, of the entrance into the circle with hydrangeas and then other plantings uh, such as this Sissus vine uh, in front of the front door. The Rosen Gardens chose the, the site uh, quite well. They built the house on top of a uh, really wonderful hill. Uh, and this view is one of the most uh, uh, iconic settings of Chanticleer. Um, the furniture that uh, you can sit on as you're enjoying that view uh, was made by our staff members uh, using wood, uh, white oak uh, wood that, uh, from a tree that had died and fallen on the property. Um, and people always ask what we do in the winter. And one of the things that staff do is they make furniture uh, gates and bridges. We have a wood shop and a metal shop. Uh, and we also do some stone work. Just off the west end of the house, just above that view that you just saw is the sun porch. Um, this was the favorite room of the house uh, for the Rosen Gardens. Uh, it became enclosed as the elder Mrs. Rosen Garden uh, aged. Uh, and then when we were going to open to the public, we uh, took out, out the windows. Uh, we have it furnished, uh, obviously, with a number of plants as well as furniture made by our staff. And we welcome our guests to come in there and sit. Um, and uh, you can sit there and wait for the butler to bring you a glass of wine. I've sat there days and the butler just never seems to come out. But uh, we'd, we'd like you to have the feeling that you're visiting the Rosen Gardens, that we're still a private garden, uh, even though it is open to the public. And then there is a south facing terrace on the other side of the house. Um, this was originally primarily lawns with a couple of flower beds. Uh, we've now uh, reimagined that landscape. Uh, you can still see the swimming pool, which is uh, an important part of the view. And I think again, symbolizes the feeling of a private garden uh, that is open just for you. Um, the swimming pool is used after hours by our staff. Uh, and then we took uh, one of the lawn areas and we made it into what I call a flowery lawn. It's a, um, a very uh, well manicured meadow, if you will, uh, starting with bulbs in the spring uh, and then going to summer flowers, uh, many of which were chosen to attract pollinators like uh, bees and uh, moths and butterflies, as well as hummingbirds. Uh, and then this is one of the flower beds. And I thought I'd go through how one of the ways that we transition from season to season. Um, we could plant this bed all with uh, spring flowering bulbs, all with tulips, for instance, and do a big mass display that would be a knockout. But the problem is that um, the day after the tulips finish, the bed would look rather dull. Uh, and so what we do is we generally do a mixed planting 
Uh, and so you see the tulips uh, wind their way around, wind their way through this bed, uh, and then they're uh, accompanied by foliage plants, uh, some of which are in the container. You can see those are actually some lettuces, uh, as well as some sedges, uh, and there's some sedges, uh, lettuces, uh, mustards, um, and wallflowers in this bed. And then as the tulips uh, go past, uh, we pull them out. And because it's not filling the whole bed, that doesn't create a huge hole. Uh, you can see the wallflowers, the purple leaf mustards, uh, I think some uh, snapdragons uh, are still there to hold on display. Um, and then we put in, uh, in this case, we put in some sedges. Uh, in the left-hand photo, you can see the sedges with lettuces, which will take cool uh, conditions quite well. Uh, and then the right photo shows what it looked like in the summer. We then replaced the cool season annuals with some tropical plants, again, primarily foliage plants. Uh, and then it's a purple leaved um, mimosa as the woody plant up above the, the planting. And then in 2020, the year 2020, we, we grew primarily vegetables uh, on these terraces. Um, I felt we did a great uh, job in designing it. I mean, David Mattern, who's in charge of this area, did. Um, we wanted to share, plant, share vegetables uh, with local food pantries uh, and grow lots of food. And there was, as you know, there was a huge demand uh, for assistance in that way. And so uh, in this bed, there are cabbages, there are lettuces, uh, there are carrots. Uh, and I'm not sure you can see, you see the beets, but there are also beets as well as agave. Um, and then later in the summer, we planted it with sweet corn. And I like to think the agave and the uh, sweet corn uh, gave us uh, tequila and tacos um, as an effect uh, in the garden uh, or a virtual effect, if you will. Uh, containers are very important on these, uh, on the Chanticleer terraces as well as in the teacup. Uh, we do spring containers and then summer containers, a second planting. Uh, as you know, in doing containers in the spring, it's hard to get uh, height. Uh, and so we have uh, a number of uh, willow trees and dogwoods that have colorful branches. And so we prune those during the winter months, we save those branches and then we use them in containers. Uh, so in willow branches in the left photo um, are used to give height to the container. In the middle photo, uh, we actually took the uh, twigs outside of the container uh, and did lattice work, if you will, uh, on the container and then had branches go high. And then in the containers on the right, we had some young birch trees uh, that we focused or we featured uh, in the planting to give us height. Summer months, uh, here's some examples. And again, uh, often featuring uh, foliage, uh, a large uh, lotus land begonia in the center shot um, and an individual South African bulb uh, in the upper right-hand um, planter, uh, Sertanthus. And here, a couple of containers from last year. Um, featuring cabbages and in the upper photo on the right-hand side, uh, lettuces as well. Uh, and I was really amazed at how beautiful these uh, containers were of, of vegetables. And we did arches of tomatoes. Um, so this is a, uh, a cherry tomato uh, arches on the, the patio uh, such that you could, if you, were sneaky, you could grab a tomato as you walked by. And I confess I may have been sneaky a couple times. Um, you saw what a large hill, the Chanticleer hillside is. Um, getting up and down that in a public garden is a challenge. Uh, and for a number of years, we had to ask people who had mobility issues to turn around and go in a different direction. Uh, but about five years ago, we added uh, an elevated walkway to get people up and down the hill um, in a totally accessible way, but also one that didn't make you feel like you were on um, a special ramp. Uh, instead, we made it um, as part of the garden, planted a 
rather manicured meadow around it. Uh, the walkway rises above the ground about eight feet at its highest point and about two feet below grade at its lowest point, um, getting you up and down the hill easily. And when you come to the bottom of the hill, you come to the area we call the Serpentine. And the Serpentine um, was inspired by a Tuscan hillside. Uh, and we always plant it with something uh, ag agricultural. Um, and so the uh, last year we did um, black eyed peas. Uh, we've done uh, in this shot, uh, there are uh, mustards uh, growing. And then we had, we threw in some poppy seeds to give us some, some weeds to grow in it. Uh, off to the left, uh, the gray leaved plants are willows, um, but have been pruned to look like olives. Uh, and then there's an aerial hedge on the right in the back of, of ginkgo trees. More shots of, of the serpentine in various years. Um, we, we generally don't do something that's real floriferous, although we have done sunflowers a couple of years. Uh, but one of the uh, most interesting ones I thought was kale in the, the lower right. And we used three different cultivars of kale. And this was the black eyed peas from last year. And I was amazed at how pretty their flowers were and also how uh, interesting the, the pods were. And then these are the willow trees. Uh, and these are the ones that produce a lot of the colored branches for us in our containers. Um, and we, uh, since everything looks better older, um, uh, we, uh, want the trunks to get bigger and the branches to get bigger. And so what we do is we weave the branches together uh, and they eventually graft onto each other, uh, making for a larger trunk uh, and larger branches. Uh, as you go further uh, westward in the garden, you come to the bald meadow and this is a meadow of grasses and then all the flowers in the meadow are come from bulbs, uh, flowering bulbs. And so it starts out in the spring uh, with hyacinths and narcissus and um, uh, tulips and then goes to camassia. Uh, and then in the lower right you can see the we let the grass um, uh, get long and we let the bulk foliage mature and then in uh, then we cut it uh, and then in July and August we have like chorus the spring uh, the surprise lilies uh, and then in uh, September October we have culture gums in the upper right hand photo and a shot of uh, early October with culture gums in bloom and a large uh, black walnut in the background just down the hill from the Bald Meadow uh, is Asian Woods. Uh, and this is an area where we feature plants from China, Korea, and Japan. Um, we're now also as far from the entrance as you can get and at about the lowest point in the garden. Uh, and so we uh, felt there was a strong need for a restroom in this area. Uh, and so we uh, sent two staff members to Japan to look at architecture as well as gardens. Uh, and they came back and helped us design what we affectionately call our Japanese pea house. And then here are the plantings, uh, all featuring plants from Asia um, and much of it uh, highlighting the, the foliage, the strong foliage effect of these plants. Uh, a bridge made uh, by our staff leads you out of Asian woods and brings you up to the pond garden. Um, there are five ponds uh, that uh, cascade essentially down the hillside or spillways cascade down the hillside uh, featuring a, uh, a very robust uh, meadow or a perennial garden around the edges of the meadow of the pond uh, and then some water plants in the pond including lotuses which are uh, always a big hit with our guests uh, start which start blooming in mid-july and bloom throughout much of August. At the top of the pond area is an arbor uh, with staff made photograph uh, uh, furniture. 
uh, wisteria blooming in the spring. And then in the lower right photo, you see the uh, Virginia creeper has been trimmed, uh, pruned very lovingly uh, to essentially just dangle from the arbor. Uh, and when Virginia creeper comes into its autumn color, it uh, is a real knockout. Uh, this is a shot from the pond garden. Looking up to the right, you can see the Chanticleer house. Uh, we'll be going up the hill to the left, which will lead us to the ruin garden uh, and the uh, gravel garden. Uh, the gravel garden is a southwest facing hillside, uh, so it's naturally hot and dry. Uh, we've added gravel to the soil, which has increased drainage uh, and gives us uh, with the planting uh, gives us almost a Mediterranean effect. And this is an area that does not need uh, to be watered. Uh, from the gravel garden, looking up uh, to the ruin. Um, and then there's stone furniture nearby, which when you come visit, please make sure you sit down and try the furniture. We don't usually think of stone furniture as being most comfortable with these uh, were made by a staff member and uh, they're actually quite comfortable and uh, people sit on them for um, 20, 30 minutes at a time. Uh, sometimes they even sit and read a book. <clears throat> and you can see the ruin in the background. Uh, the ruin is built on the site of Adolf Rosengarten Jr.'s house. Uh, the house was taken down in 2000 in order to build the ruin. Uh, this was the dream and the design of my predecessor, Christopher Woods. Um, and um, the, the house was actually totally taken down and then the walls, new walls were built to look as if that house fell into disrepair, which it never did. Um, the terracotta roof tiles, which uh, had been on, obviously on the roof of the house, have been repurposed uh, in the paving uh, and give you the curly Q effect uh, in the flooring here. And just on the other side of the ruin is a meadow of it's primarily one plant, which is prairie drop seed grass, uh, Sporobolus heterolepis. Um, in the summer months, uh, it has almost a wave effect. It's a clumping grass. And so you get the clumps of grass and then the lower areas in between. I, I've fallen totally in love with this plant. Um, I think it's attractive every single day of the year. Um, late summer, it turns uh, an orangish tan uh, during the summer months, as you'd seen, uh, it's green uh, and then starts blooming in August uh, and has a delightful fragrance, um, delightful fragrance for most people. Uh, I think it smells like cilantro flavored popcorn. Um, uh, other people have other ideas, and if they don't like cilantro, they usually don't like the scent of it. Um, and then just down the hill from there, you come to the creek. Uh, there's a creek that uh, runs through the whole property called Bell's Run. Um, we've planted about uh, 25 to 30,000 uh, camassia bulbs uh, that bloom in early May uh, along the creek. Uh, there's a water wheel that originally pumped water to fountains at the Chanticleer House, and it now pumps water to a, a nearby fountain um, that uh, we built uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so that fountain has no, uh, no electrical hookup. It is uh, powered strictly by the water wheel, and the water wheel is um, powered by gravity flow water from the creek. And then as you go a little bit further, you come to Bell's Woodland, which is one of our newer areas of the garden. It's a native plant woodland uh, featuring plants of the eastern North, uh, North America uh, forests. Um, there's, there are two paths through it. One is a totally accessible uh, pathway that you see here. Um, it goes around a big white oak uh, in the sp uh, spring in May. Uh, is filled with trilliums. Uh, and then you see the still same circle on the right um, with spigelius coming into bloom a little later after the trilliums. And here is the secondary path uh, through Bell's Woodland. Uh, it's a stone path that takes you closer to the creek. Um, it is not fully accessible. It has a few steps in it, uh, but uh, is, gives you a totally different effect of the forest. 
and then it goes under this bridge. And this was a bridge that was made by Przemek Balczak, the gardener for this area. Uh, when we first started designing the area and talking about it, he he said he came to me and said, "Bill, can you know? Can I? We need a bridge, and can I build it?" Uh, and so we actually brought in a prefab bridge, uh, and then he spent about uh, five winters covering it uh, to make it look like a fallen tree. Uh, and you walk through part of the tree and uh, walk uh, over the bridge, uh, either e entering or exiting the. Uh, Bill's Woodland Garden. And if you're exiting it, you come to our vegetable garden. Um, this is designed, uh, first of all, to be productive. Uh, and we share the vegetables uh, and the harvest with our staff as well as local food pantries. Uh, and it's also, uh, again, an uh, exhibition of what vegetables can be grown in our area and some of the ways to grow them. Uh, nearby is a hedge of asparagus, uh, which uh, in the spring uh, on the right hand shot we, we pick uh, regularly. Uh, we've thrown in some uh, forget me not seeds uh, to give a little more display in the spring. Uh, it makes for very fine eating. The terracotta containers that you see there are called rhubarb pots, they're for rhubarb forcing. Uh, but we use that in the asparagus beds. Uh, we just place it over a clump of asparagus that blocks out all light. And so as the asparagus comes up, it is white asparagus. And uh, I found that many people have never seen white asparagus or have, uh, if they've seen it or eaten it, they didn't know how it was grown. And it's just uh, simply uh, keeping it out of light. And then nearby is a bench uh, made by several staff members uh, featuring vegetables. It's, uh, on uh, the back, it's Swiss chard and pumpkins, the legs are carrots, and the seats, when you sit down, you'll see our lima beans. Next to the vegetable garden is the cut flower garden, um, where we grow plants for uh, display in uh, our uh, flower arrangements, uh, which we have at the entrance desk in the Chanticleer house, as well as in the restrooms. Um, we redid this area several years ago, uh, and uh, it used to be four large uh, planting beds, uh, and we made it into a number of small raised beds uh, that you walk through. Uh, last year, we uh, instead of doing a lot of flowers, we primarily did vegetables for sharing. Uh, this coming year, we'll, we'll do a combination of flowers for cut flowers as well as vegetables. And this is some of the harvest that we get both from the vegetable garden uh, and from the cut flower garden, uh, again, sharing with food pantries as well as our staff. And last year we gave about 40, uh, 4,500 pounds of vegetables away. Um, and so we felt very happy that we were uh, able to assist in some ways, um, make life a little better and more nutritional for people. Uh, flowers from the cut flower garden are used, as I mentioned, in restrooms at the main entrance desk, as well as the Chanticleer house. The arrangements are done by our staff members. Um, in the upper left, uh, one of our interns, Margaret Easter, uh, a couple years ago was doing the arrangement. Um, we also do floating flowers in several areas of the garden. Um, these are essentially, um, they could be as simple as just floating flowers. Uh, our staff doesn't stick to simplicity. Um, although if I'm doing the flowering, the floating flowers, I'm afraid I just cut some flowers and put them in the water, but they've now gotten, so they do very intricate arrangements in these uh, containers. Uh, question always is what we do for mosquito control. And because we're open five days a week, we're open Wednesday through Sunday through throughout the season. Um, we we empty these containers every Monday morning. Um, and so the, uh, the mosquitoes do not have uh, enough time to complete their life cycle. Uh, and then we fill the water again on Wednesday uh, and put in the flowers. We're very interested uh, in being an environmentally, environmentally sensitive garden. Uh, and so each year we do projects to try to increase um, 
the uh, being gentle on the environment. Uh, and so we take out some areas that are lawn areas and make them into something else. So on the left-hand photo, that's a bed of sedges or carracks. Upper right, um, that's a bed of a, a fine fescue grass that only gets to be about eight inches tall. Uh, and then the lower right, uh, that's uh, by the Chanticleer House terraces, the uh, flowery lawn, uh, an area again that had been mowed um, once a week, probably for 99 years. Uh, and now we mow it about twice a year. With, uh, with the work that we're doing, we're increasing the uh, fauna uh, in the garden. Uh, we have uh, a, a good population of bees, of birds, of insects, um, butterflies, and moths. Uh, I mentioned trees earlier, and uh, Chanticleer would not be the garden it is without uh, our beautiful large trees. Um, when we do lose a tree, such as in the lower right, um, wherever possible, we, uh, we keep the trunk up um, or part of the trunk, trunk up as much as we feel is safe. Uh, and that becomes a home for insects and fungus and, uh, and then birds and other wildlife. Uh, and then we continue to plant young trees. And so you know, in the left-hand picture, you see a young tree growing near uh, an older tree um, and uh, coexisting quite well. And um, I like to th think of the young tree as not being the replacement, uh, but a future colleague um, or friend uh, to the big tree. Um, we're surrounded by water, uh, by roads on three sides. So, so water issues um, are important. We get a lot of runoff from the roadways as well as we have a large parking area um, that of course has runoff. So we try to capture as much water as we can. We have about 50,000 gallons of cistern space or capacity on the property. We capture the water. Um, in some cases, if it's necessary, we'll filter it. Uh, and then use it for irrigation. In other places, and uh, such as the lower left, uh, you see basins that we've added, uh, and that's just above the serpentine to, again, capture and slow down water uh, coming onto the property. Uh, we have solar panels in a couple of places, but, but primarily in the um, our service area and we, uh, with these solar panels, we produce about 18% of our total uh, electrical usage. Um, I don't think you can garden well without composting um, because we're a, a large, relatively large garden, uh, about 35 acres. Uh, we do have a, a large compost area. Uh, we pump air into our compost pile. And by doing that, we can have finished compost uh, usually within two to three months, which uh, gives us excellent, excellent quality and also is efficient in taking up less space uh, by having a, a speedy uh, decomposition for the compost piles. Um, we do grow a number of non-hardy plants. Uh, and so we have three greenhouses where we overwinter plants. Uh, they are insulated greenhouses um and kept at different temperatures depending on what the plants are in it but always the lowest temperature possible uh, and because the greenhouses are insulated they don't uh, require a whole lot of um, energy uh, and the floor the heating is done by radiant floor heating which is also an efficient way of doing it um, I mentioned about our wood stop, wood shop, metal shop, and our stone work. Um, and so these are examples of work done by staff. Um, a couple of uh, a bench, uh, wooden bench, uh, Osage Orange that Lisa Roper made at the top. Um, Doug Randolph, uh, who uh, was on our staff, did a lot of stone work and he did the bench and the uh, drinking fountain. And then Dan Benarsik, one of the horticulturists shown working with white oak wood from the property uh, that making it into a table. In our metal shop, uh, Joe Henderson is one of the horticulturists who works in the metal shop and this shows him uh, working on some railings. Um, and then we have another gardener do uh, 
flange bamboo for a bridge on the right. And then Laurel Varan, who was one of our horticulturists, did the mural uh, in the Apple House, which is uh, a little building uh, by the elevated walkway. We could not uh, do what we do uh, without um, a wonderful staff. Uh, the upper left shows our full-time horticultural staff. Um, uh, this was taken a couple of years ago, but our full-time horticultural staff uh, numbers 14. And um, they are, uh, most of them are in, responsible for areas uh, and all of them are responsible for helping train our interns and guest gardeners. Um, lower photo shows uh, interns and seasonal uh, and part-time staff uh, who assist throughout the garden. Um, but one of the things that has always impressed me with Chattopur staff is that they're bright, talented, and very creative. Um, and so a few years ago, we put together um, a book uh, called The Art of Gardening, uh, or The Art of Gardening at Chanticleer, uh, which talks about how we design the garden, uh, how we put it all together um, you know, for you to enjoy when you come to visit. Um, we're located in the Philadelphia area, which is uh, known as America's Garden Capital. There are more public gardens uh, within 30 miles of Philadelphia than in any other place in North America. Connecticut, I think of as perhaps being the garden state, sorry, New Jersey, uh, but uh, Connecticut has always impressed me about the wonders of your private gardens. Uh, many of which uh, I know you are involved with, your own gardens. Um, uh, but we claim, the, uh, the came, we claim fame for having uh, many public gardens. So I do hope you'll come visit. When you do, um, again, we're about um, 20 to 30 minutes outside of Philadelphia. If you go a little further west, a little farther outside of the city, you come to Longwood Gardens, uh, which is, um, the largest and most famous garden in this area, uh, but there are uh, more than 30 gardens within 30 miles of Philadelphia. Chanticleer is open uh, spring through fall. Uh, this coming year will open for the season on March 31 and we will end the season on October 31. We're open Wednesdays through Sundays uh, and Friday nights uh, during the summer months we're open till 8 p.m. Um, and the general time is uh, 10 to five. Uh, we do have an admission charge of $10 uh, and, uh, and children uh, 12 and under are free of charge. Um, Rob Cardillo, whom some of you know, uh, did many of the photographs as did Lisa Roper. And I know some of you also know Lisa Roper, one of our horticulturists. And Brian Carroll did the drone photos. Um, uh, now might be a, a good time, Patricia, to uh, show, uh, to do another poll. Um, I'm curious as to how many of you have taken online courses uh, this last year or sometime in the past. Um, we're doing some online classes uh, as well as other classes. Um, we have one coming up this Sunday, uh, David Culp, um, who's a nearby gardener, is going to be talking about his book, um, I'll do my little survey here. Um, uh, he'll be talking about his book and his own garden, uh, A Year at Brandywine Cottage. Uh, this will be done to, via Zoom this coming Sunday at 3 p.m. Um, you're welcome to sign up for it. It's free of charge. Um, sign up uh, will end uh, at the end of the day on Friday. Uh, you can find more information and how, how to sign up for it on our website, which is chanticleergarden.org. Um, we have a de garden design workshop that will be done in autumn. Annie Guilfoyle will be coming over from the United Kingdom. She's a garden designer uh, and it will be a multiple day workshop. I don't think we'll be doing that online. Um, that's one that is best in person. Um, and then we'll have some other classes that will be uh, announced uh, in the coming months uh, on our website. You can also sign up for our uh, uh, for 
emails from us. Uh, and again, that's uh, available on our website, chancleargarden.org. And interestingly, 44%, um, sorry to lean in there, uh, have taken class online classes. Um, and, uh, and there are 15% of you who are interested in taking, uh, taking some. And um, so it's a brand new, brand new year or brand new uh, period. We, uh, people have held off on doing uh, online classes and now we've uh, all been moving towards them. One of the things I think is interesting is that you don't have to travel for them. And um, uh, such as today, um, I was able to speak with you all uh, in New England uh, without leaving the comfort of my own home, although I would have rather come up uh, to uh, New Canaan. Um, but uh, also, I, you know, you can participate in international Zooms uh, and classes. Uh, there are lots of opportunities out there. Um, and at this point, um, I'm going to uh, turn it over. I believe there may be some questions, and uh, but yes, we, I do want to say thank you very much for having me um, speak with you today. We are so grateful, Bill, for all you have presented to us, and there are uh, quite a few questions, some of which you answered at the end of the talk. People wanted to know if you did your own photography, for example. Um, they, but there's some interesting questions here about the the plants themselves. So I'd like to start with that. Uh, what variety of hydrangeas are in front of the house? It was one of the earlier slides. As so you, in front of the Chanticleer house at that gravel circle, there are um, a mixture of, of cultivars and actually seedlings. They're all either hydrangea macrophylla or hydrangea serrata. Uh, both of those uh, species bloom on old wood uh, meaning that you can't cut them to the ground in the winter or you'll have uh, no flowers. We've been selecting um, selecting the plants that it, it also means in a hard winter for us, and I'm sure that's definitely the case for uh, Connecticut, um, is that you can lose the flower buds just to uh, cold damage. Um, so we've been selecting ones that do well for us. Uh, one of the cultivars that I'm really fond of is Preziosa, um, P-R-E-Z-I-O-S-A. Um, that one has never missed uh, a, a bloom in the 17 years that I've been here. Um, and it's a known as a mop head type, so they're all sterile flowers, um, and they tend to uh, as you know, color can change, either be pink or blue, depending on the soil type. Um, Preziosa for us seems to be more of a purple. Um, and so far we haven't gotten it to be either pink or blue, it's more of a purple. Uh, many people wanted to know if they could see uh, a list of the plants you mentioned. And uh, before you answer that, I, I would like to give a little pitch for your book. I'm not sure it's coming up on the screen, which is, readily available at Elm Street Books. So uh, there, many of these pictures are illustrated and they have the um, variety is listed right below the pictures. But- um, So the other thing, I, and, and Nancy, that is a, uh, thank you for mentioning Elm Street Books and, and the book itself. Um, so that is a great way to learn about, um, more about some of the plants that I've mentioned, some that you saw in the photos. Uh, if you go onto our website, chanticleergarden.org, uh, there is a plant list section. Uh, and so there are plant lists for each of the garden areas. Uh, and then you can also go into what's in bloom. And we have uh, photos from each week for the last year of what was in bloom. And that will give you some plant names. And also, if you're planning a visit, that'll give you an idea of what you might see in bloom when you come to visit at that time of year. So uh, that really, <laughs> I didn't even know about that. I definitely will be checking that out today. Um, 
the other questions seem to be related to um, the the composting and the harvesting of the vegetables and so pests. So let's start with the pests. <laughs> how do you keep deer out and how do you keep pests of any any sort out of the vegetable gardens? So deer, we have a deer fence around the whole garden. Um, and so that um, is quite effective for us. The deer fence went up maybe 25 years ago. And I think probably for the first 10 years, we kept, uh, deer kept finding places to get through. So it, um, it was not an easy process, but we kept figuring out where they were getting through and kept um, either patching or adding a uh, fence uh, to those areas. Um, so we, we could not do what we do if we um, had uh, a large number of deer in the garden. And this, I know uh, much of Connecticut has uh, a large deer population and certainly this area of Pennsylvania does. Um, in terms of um, pests in, in the garden and specifically with the vegetable garden, we grow our vegetables and anything that uh, people will eat, uh, we grow totally organically. Um, and therefore we don't wanna use any, uh, any pesticide on them that would, um, would make it that it was not an organically grown plant. Uh, coal crops are one of the biggest challenges, uh, cabbages, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, and we use Bacillus thuringiensis on that, which is a um, also known as Bt, and that kills um, um, the worms uh, that uh, the cabbage worms that uh, will eat those leaves. Um, we have to apply that once a week. Um, it's a fungus. It is considered uh, totally harmless for humans, not good for uh, the cabbage worms. Uh, we don't do it, we spray it um, or dust it very specifically so it is not going out uh, elsewhere to kill other, uh, other caterpillars. Um, we do a lot of picking of insects, um, just physically picking off um, both in the vegetable garden and elsewhere in the garden. Uh, elsewhere in the garden, we, we, can, we do what's called integrated pest management. And so we, um, we avoid spraying whenever we can. We use the least toxic method uh, when we need, do need to spray. Uh, and we also, in all parts of the garden, we work very hard to have the plants be as healthy as possible. And that one of the biggest ways of doing that is having good soil. Uh, and so we add a lot of organic matter uh, to, the, to the soil. Uh, we keep the, we avoid compaction of the soil. Um, so we're doing everything that we can to increase the biological activity of the soil uh, to give us good, healthy plants. Oh, a very specific question about your um, sp serpentine garden with the uh, black-eyed peas from last year. Do you harvest from that serpentine garden? Yes, we do harvest from the serpentine garden if, um, if in most years. So with black eyed peas, we, we let them dry uh, and then we harvested them. Uh, we did it by hand. Um, the, uh, some years when we've grown wheat um, or barley, we have just composted that. We have not uh, actually harvested the seed. We have not gotten good on our grain harvesting yet. Uh, but at some point we expect to, to do that. Um, this year, I think we're going to grow sorghum as a summer crop and we will probably not harvest that either. Um, last year, before the black eyed peas, we grew garden peas or shelling peas and those we did harvest um, and shared. Um, there's been a, a really real interest in your funding and Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, uh, Mr. Rosengarten um, gave, left us a very good size endowment um, that provides for about 85% of our budget. So we're a very fortunate garden uh, to have an endowment that provides that much of the budget. The other 15% comes from revenues that we raise here 
with the largest amount coming from admission fees. One person said $10 is not enough money. You should charge more because she was so impressed with what she saw. <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice. We'll, um, <laughs> we'd be happy to have donations too, although uh, we don't actively solicit donations. But, uh, <laughs> what about uh, volunteers uh, for your garden? How many so are we have a, a small group of volunteers, um, which include students from nearby Longwood Gardens. Um, I'm afraid during 2020, we did not have any volunteers, but we're looking forward to welcoming them back in 2021. Somebody who came in a little later uh, was unaware that we put this up on YouTube uh, within about a week or so. And the Beautification League website is the place to find the, the link to get to that YouTube. So I thought I'd answer that one for them. So that, because people want to see this again and maybe again. <laughs> so we, we put it up for everybody to be able to, to review it and see it and absorb it. Um, you've answered the question, you don't use chemicals, but some people would like to know more about the composting and specifically pumping air into the uh, compost. Yes. Tell us more about that because you know we, we, that, that's a new idea that for many people. Okay, so with, with composting, one way of doing compost uh, is to just make a pile of, of debris. And, and that's what a lot of people do in their gardens. And you, you either just keep adding to it or you once a year start a new pile. And then when the old pile breaks down, you use that. And that's a perfectly acceptable way of doing it. Um, you may get weed seeds in there. If you, put in, uh, if you put in weed seeds, you may not get it heated up enough to kill off weed seeds, uh, but that, that's a perfectly fine way of composting. Another way is to regularly turn the pile. Um, and by turning the pile, one generally will get it to heat up um, because decomposition will produce its own heat. Um, and you can sometimes get it be warm enough that it will actually kill off weed seeds. Another way of, and what turning does is it adds oxygen uh, to the, um, to the pile, allowing for uh, more efficient breakdown of the, the material. What we do is we do not turn the pile, but when we're building the compost pile, we put in perforated pipes at the bottom of the pile and then connect those to a fan. Um, and, then as, uh, and then we monitor the temperature of the compost pile, we're very careful how we layer the material in, um, and uh, which is also done to give us efficiency and also good heating uh, of, the, of the compost pile. Um, by monitoring the, the temperature, we also then uh, decide how often we run the fan, um, and that uh, is a very efficient way to have the compost pile. And therefore within two to three months, we have the compost uh, finished and we can take it out. And we use it as a soil amendment. We also use it as uh, potting soil in our containers. Well, the la last question I think for this session might be about the pink tulips. Those were quite impressive to everybody. And it looked like you, when you lifted the pink tulips, they had not died back. So how do you store them and are the stems left on? Okay, very good question. So in many areas of the garden, we have perennial tulips that we leave in the garden year round. We've chosen ones that tend to be more perennializing and we plant those deep in really good drainage and ideally don't water during the summer months, excuse me, because perennial tulips um, are best if they're kept dry during the summer months. The photograph where the question came from, that's in the bed area by the Chanticleer house, and we do not have in that bed, the tulips are not perennial, uh, and we only use them for one year in that spot. Therefore, we do not leave the foliage on to, uh, to ripen in sight. Uh, if you wanted those tulips to be perennial, you would leave them there and you would leave the foliage on until it died back. What we do by pulling them is uh, we then 
Occasionally we'll transplant them to other places in the garden. Otherwise we let our staff and volunteers take them home if they would like. Uh, it's hard on the plants, hard on the tulips to be moved like that. So it's not the ideal situation, but at the same time, you very often by planting them immediately uh, and not cutting off the foliage, letting the foliage then ripen can get the plants uh, to survive well. You could also put them in pots, uh, again, cover them with soil and let them ripen the bulbs and then put the plant the bulbs in uh, in autumn when you would normally be planting tulip bulbs. And that really didn't become the last question because we still have more questions coming. Uh, and one of them is about having a picnic on the grass. Is that, uh, can a family set themselves up this summer? Yes. So, so on, on Friday nights, um, May through August, when we're open till 8 p.m., we welcome people to picnic throughout the garden. So on the grass, uh, wherever they would like. Uh, during 2020, um, we allowed people to picnic at any time uh, on the grass. Uh, in past years, we've asked them to eat in one of our three picnic areas that are in the garden. Um, and if they want to be on the grass, that they would set up near the, the picnic, uh, near the picnic table. I confess we have not made a decision about 2021, what we're doing. And uh, so I would say if, if that's important to you to, if, to eat on the grass, especially in a place of the garden that you, that's away from the picnic areas, um, just check our website closer to the time of your visit and we'll, we'll be giving information about picnicking. And then I hope this is the last question, but people are very interested. Uh, somebody would ask, what is the name of that grass that smells like popcorn or and cilantro? So that grass is uh, a native grass and it's called prairie drop seed grass. Okay. I think if you, if you search online for prairie drop seed grass, you'll come up with it. The Latin name is Sparabolus heterolepis. <laughs> okay. And if you go on to the, I think if you go on to our plant list in the ruin area, you'll see its spelling. Well, thank you very, very much. This has been well beyond most of our expectations. And it was just the dose of spring that, and color that we needed at this time of the year. And with that, I, I, Karen Hansen will come on. And <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. How do I get it up? Hi, here I am. Turn on your light. Hello. You're Can here, you hear me? Karen. We've got you. Thank you. Oh, good. I, what a great presentation. A spectacular, comprehensive, wonderful. I just love it. It's amazing. I especially like all those natural areas and the floating flowers. I can't believe it. Wonderful. Thank you everybody for participating. I really think we all learned so much from this. But, but moving on, we have to look forward to our next speaker, who is Roy Diblick. He's an expert on garden maintenance, mostly perennials, and he'll show us how to minimize maintenance. So that's wonderful. and. Uh, Mark your calendars for February 3rd, which is a Wednesday at 9.30. We look forward to seeing you all there. Take care. Have a good day. That's it.